Thanks for letting me speak. And thanks all for coming in on such a beautiful sunny day to an underground room to listen to me. Um, okay, um, so yeah, my title is a bit long. I wrote that when I was in a hurry. But yeah, so you, many, perhaps all of you will have heard of this celebrated result of smales from 1950s that you can avert a sphere, which I'll explain what that is. Um, and uh, some years ago, Patrick Masso, who's not here, uh, thought this would be a really good target for formalization, but not, not just to avert the sphere. I mean, of course, this would be a worthy goal in some sense, but what's much better is not to have like an endpoint result. There's not too many theorems which begin, you know, by the sphere aversion result. <laughs> you don't tend to apply it that much. And what we really like to add to the library and what we really like to formalize in MathLib are like results that have many corollaries. So Patrick had this vision of formalizing what's called the H principle, which is this deep result due to Gromov and differential topology, from which the sphere version then follows like very, very easily. So this is all his vision. Um, and I'm now gonna tell you what I mean by some of these things. So just before I start, I mean, I had great fun working on this project. There were moments of frustration, but it was great fun. It was a collaborative project uh, with actually many people, not all of them appear here, uh, but the, you know, the three main players were uh, Floris, Patrick, and me. And so this is some GitHub stats, and this doesn't tell the full story for a variety of reasons, but it, it, it does tell, I think, an unbiased story. So you can see up here that like Flowers and Patrick have done a lot more than I did. Uh, and especially at certain points towards the end, like the efforts of Flowers were amazingly heroic. So I really want to emphasize that, uh, yeah, it's kind of a little bit ironic that I'm talking here in front of him. I, mean, I did plenty, but you know, he did even more. So, okay. so. Yeah, so just again, before we get to the actual mathematics, comments on the experience. We all did it part time. Uh, you know, we had other projects that we were dipping in and out of. Um, and there was no like strict window of like this was t equals zero and this is the moment we completed because there's various senses in which you complete. Like maybe you get something sorry free and then you get like a stronger version sorry free and then you like improve it in, in various other ways. But roughly speaking, we spent about a year part time on this. Um, and uh, yeah, again, there were other people who contributed like Anatole Dedeker and Heather Macbeth and Yuri Kudryashov and Sebastian Gozel implicitly and Johan Kamlin and Scott Morrison all helped us. So, but, but it was mostly three people working part-time for a year. So just to give a sense of what was required to achieve what I'm gonna talk about. Um, okay, so, you know, why did we do this? Uh, partly because Patrick, partly because Patrick encouraged us to, but, um, I'm not gonna talk about the bigger question of why formalized mathematics at all. Um, let's just agree that you are interested in formalizing mathematics for some reason. Um, then, you know, why do sphere aversion? Why do the H principle? Well, it's fun. Uh, I think it's really beautiful mathematics. Um, as I alluded to, you know, a few moments ago, um, the sphere aversion is a corollary of a really useful theorem due to Gramov from the 1970s, which, you know, it's just, uh, an important result in differential topology that we just actually want to be able to use to prove other things uh, in addition to sphere aversion. Um, and then, you know, why differential topology as a subject at all? Well, you know, um, it, it's, it's basically, it's an underrepresented subject uh, in formalization. So, you know, there's plenty of examples of people who formalized algebra, like, you know, a moment ago, Somebody mentioned I'd done some Lie algebra work. And you know, it's not surprising that I was able to formalize the algebra. It mostly just required you know, sufficient patience on my part. Um, and you know, then there's also like, and there's lots and lots of different types of algebras that have been done. You know, rings, groups, all these commutative algebra things. And these are all, you know, uh, some of them are quite good achievements, but they're all unsurprising achievements given the history, because there's been a long established pattern of this sort of mathematics being formalized. Analysis also, uh, there's, you know, numerous notable successes there in formalization. Um, and, you know, and then other subjects like yesterday, we heard about measure theory. That's like a really nice theory of measure theory and lean that's been developed. Um, there's like point set topology. Um, so, you know, mathematics has others logic. We just heard about like deep theorems of logic have been achieved, but there was very little differential topology. And okay, so that's one reason. But then there's another reason to focus on differential topology, which is, um, you know, if you've studied differential topology, you, you definitely will have seen books where the, the proof is a picture. And, you know, it's like formalize that. Um, and, you know, people are like, well, you know, buy some continuity arguments. Okay, what is exactly the continuity in arguments? It's like, are you sure, you know, those points all remain within that set? So it's, it's a subject that I think is, it's less obvious that you will, what the challenges will be 
when you attempt to formalize this. So, um, and I think there may even have been some people who were skeptical that this could be achieved. So, you know, we'll just do it and prove them wrong. Um, yeah, and then, you know, we're interested in formalizing mathematics, at least I am, and hopefully some of the people here at the end of the week still are. Um, so, you know, we, making mathematics, uh, you know, available to a computer so you can digitally manipulate it seems like an interesting thing to do, even just beyond correctness, uh, which is more of a side issue, I think. Um, but in addition to that, you know, we care about the, the proof checking software. You know, for example, in our previous talk, you know, it was advertised to us that like we really need better automation and that maybe we can have it and we would really like that. Um, and so how do you learn about your proof checking software? You try big projects, you know, you, 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 you say, okay, here, you know, here's the H principle and, and see how lean in our case uh, reacts to an attempt to formalize that and maybe learn something about the proof assistant, maybe learn a way in which you'd like to change it, you know. So, okay, so this is some of the motivation for why this target. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to sketch the like rough ideas of the mathematics, uh, make sure that people have some idea what we actually did, uh, and because I think it's nice mathematics, some people here will know all of this stuff, but uh, I'm sure at least one person doesn't. So um, okay, so you know, I'll just before I talk about immersion, I'm going to talk about a similar sounding word, which is immersion. Uh, you need to understand that if you want to understand what an immersion is. So uh, well, smooth manifolds or differentiable manifolds are uh, objects that we care about. And, you know, we know from uh, 20th century mathematics that if you care about objects, you care about their maps. Um, so if you have a pair of smooth manifolds and you care about the manifolds, then you definitely also care about the smooth maps between M and N. And these are differentiable manifolds, so I can take the derivative of a smooth map. And then, you know, what is the derivative? Well, the derivative is a family of linear maps. You know, if you like, it's the matrix of partial derivatives varying as you move over the manifold. Uh, or have I written it there? It's a dependent family of linear maps. Or it's a morphism of the vector bundle of the tangent bundle of M to the pullback of the tangent bundle of N. Um, but the, anyway, it's, it's a family of linear maps. And a linear map, you can ask, uh, is, are these injective? So once you have differentiability, there's this, you know, distinguished in, a class of morphisms that you know are worthy of some study and these are our immersions and you say okay maybe if i want to understand manifolds i should understand their maps and if i want to understand maps part of that is understanding immersions um and so you know what are the natural questions well one question is you know can i immerse m into n and there's famous results from like the 1940s or so for where whitney and others studied these questions um and then you can say all right that's fine maybe i understand when i can immerse m into n uh, obviously, there's a dimension restriction, but you know there's a much deeper theory than that. Um, but then you can say, all right, fine. What about you know when are two immersions the same, or maybe homotopic? Um, and uh, so that's the sort of question that you know, if you care about smooth manifolds, quite quickly you start to care about this set of questions that I claim, including this question at the bottom. Uh, so when are two two immersions homotopic? Um, okay, so then fine. You know, what about immersions? What are they? Well. Uh, the sphere, that's a smooth manifold that we definitely care about, and that has a natural, actually it's an embedding, but I only care that it's an immersion here. So that has a natural immersion, just the inclusion map, into its ambient space, if I regard it as points of norm one or something. Um, okay, and then just to make my life simpler, n is even for the rest of this slide. Um, so, you know, there's, there's another um, natural immersion of the sphere, so this is the antipodal map. So I take every point in the sphere, and actually I just take the straight line through the origin, and I keep going until I hit the antipodal point. And so I have a map, and, that, and I regard that as a map from the sphere into R3. So that's another immersion. Um, this is orientation reversing. And so then you can ask, you know, for the sphere naturally has these two distinguished immersions, and you can say, all right, well, what about my question from the previous slide? Are these homotopic? Um, now this is, you know, Smale who answered this question, he wasn't working on this. Um, uh, you know, I'll talk a little bit about what Smale was actually working on. Um, and then this fell out as a corollary. But, you know, it is a sort of question, it is a type of question you would hope to be able to, under, to answer if you claim to have understood uh, the space of immersions between M and N. So you, you don't directly work on this, but, you know, you should 
if you if you work on this theory of you know understanding the space of emotions, so you understand manifolds, in particular, you, you really should be able to answer questions like this. Like this is all quite concrete. Um, and uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's like the matrix of this is minus one to the n plus one, right? Yeah. 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 I just felt like it was just, I'm sorry, I misread it as saying it was a repeating question from this. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, okay. And so then these things have a name. Uh, eversion. So an eversion is just a homotopy, or actually a regular homotopy, um, between the natural inclusion and then the aversion map of the sphere. Um, okay, so, you know, that's, that's a question. Um, and then, you know, what's the answer? Well, we know since the 50s. Uh, so there's a natural topological obstruction, so just the existence of the derivative. So if you, you know, if you have an, an immersion uh, and you have, uh, or if, rather if you have an eversion, so you have this homotopy of immersions, then you can look at this family of derivatives that you have of that map forgetting that there even are the derivatives of a map, just as sections of a vector bundle that uh, satisfy the immersion condition. That's topological information, and that, that puts a topological restriction on the existence of a map that has this as derivative. Um, and so um, you can do the, that calculation. I mean, we didn't need to do this as part of our work. I'm, you know, here I'm just talking about like the general mathematical background. Um, but yeah, so there's a topological obstruction to the existence of immersions. Um, in all dimensions except for two or six. Um, and then the surprising result is that actually this necessary condition is sufficient. Um, and so in particular, there's this theorem which was a corollary of Smale's work, which is in fact, there does exist an inversion of S2 and of course of S6. Um, and so with apologies to, this is lean three code, because you know we did this project last year before we'd converted over to lean four. Uh, there is actually a project that I, uh, to my shame, haven't been involved in yet of porting the Sphere version to Lean 4 and then hopefully ultimately to, Le to MathLib itself. Um, but I just took the old Lean 3 snippet here um, since that process is, of porting Sphere version to Lean 4 is, is still work in progress. So that, that, that's why this looks a little bit weird if you're kind of used to Lean 4. Um, so this is a formal statement. Uh, of Smale's theorem directly above it. So uh, I like to kind of put the informal and the formal side by side. And of course, it depends how many definitions I fold, unfolded in each case. Um, and so this is Smale's theorem. So this uh, from the Sphere version project and you know, colon equals, you know, we have a proof of this. Um, and so it says, you know, there exists a function. Well, I was talking about homotopies of uh, inversions. So that, that function f there of whose existence we're asserting you probably are expecting instead of the real numbers, you know, the, the unit interval, right? Because it's supposed to be a homotopy. Um, and if you look at the statement of this theorem, we only care about uh, the behavior of f really between zero and one. So just for convenience, we've said, okay, it's actually this, let's just define this function on all of R. Uh, it's slightly easier. It means we can just uh, avoid worrying about endpoint issues. But if we really wanted, we could also say the, the unit interval, there would be no problem there. Okay, so that's, that's just why we see R there instead of the unit interval, even though this is supposed to be a homotopy of immersions. Um, okay, so the next line, which is quite long, that's the statement F is smooth. This Kant M diff, this is like continuously manifold, uh, continuously differentiable, the M is for manifold, so in the sense of manifolds. So, you know, the th theory of smooth maps, I think I said a little bit about this on Wednesday, you know, first we build it up for maps between uh, affi or between vector spaces, and then we promote that to a theory on manifolds. So here we have manifolds. The sphere is not a vector space, so we need a manifold derivative to talk about uh, smoothness there. So we have Kant M diff, and then you have this kind of junk, you know, I, R. So, so the first R there is saying, well, we're talking about smoothness over the reals, not over the complexes. And then R, that's the space whose smoothness we're talking about. That's the first uh, argument to F, one line above. And then there's another I, R, R3. And that's saying, again, we're talking about smoothness over the real numbers of what? Well, of R3. And then the bit in the middle that I didn't mention yet, dot prod R2, that's again notation for the usual smooth structure with respect to the reals on S2. So 
that, that like giant blob is just saying, look at smoothness with the usual smooth structures. Uh, and that, like, that does actually be need to be expressed formally somewhere. Um, today and at the time this was written, we're still explicit about that. Maybe some future day we'll like, you know, redefine our notation so that you have to be explicit only if you don't want the standard smooth structures. And then this statement would be a little bit simpler. The next, the infinity is like, how many times continuously differentiable are you? Infinite, infinite many times. And then what are we talking about? Well, F. Um, okay, so there exists this family of maps from the two sphere into R3, which is smooth. F at zero, so this is the, where the lean three weirdness comes in because we have a lambda. Actually, I think this is still valid lean four code. We just stylistically don't use it. No, the oh, right, right, right. The lambda's allowed, but the comma should be a map too, yeah. Um, so F at zero is the inclusion, so that sends X to X. F at one, that's the antipodal map, sends X to minus X. Okay, and then what about this family of, of space as well? It's an immersion um, uh, for all T. In fact, as it turns out, even for T outside the unit interval, but who cares about that? Um, okay, so that's, that's up there just to give a sense of like, at least at the time that we did this, uh, that's how this statement looked. Um, uh, formally, and you know we have complete sorry free proof of this. Um, and then, okay, I think, yeah, I think I thought just for fun, you know, probably most people have seen the not very nice video that Bill Thurston had created in the 70s, uh, which actually exhibits a sphere version and gives some, um, some uh, visual explanation of you know what the immersion condition should look like physically. So I thought it would be fun just to share this for one minute. So let's see, probably that's a goodish place. Okay, so this is my, how could I not share this beautiful video? Oops. Yeah. Um, okay, so the idea is you've got the two sphere, it's made of this material represented by this golden sheet in this picture. And so the video first is gonna show you what are the rules of the game, forgetting about the, for this material. So you can pass it through itself, you can bend it, but if you tear it, you know, you lose and the material disappears. You can, can pass it through, but if you crease it, this is the immersion condition, it also disappears. And so, and so then, you know, the question is, uh, you know, we have the sphere, now we want to try and turn it inside out. We want to continuously deform it into the antipodal map. So you're kind of, we're trying, haven't yet tried to pass it through itself, but okay, we can do that. That looks like it's pretty good, except obviously we're gonna eventually get a crease and we lose, okay? So let's try again. Maybe, you know, we try and con concentrate. No, we're gonna get a smaller crease, but we still get a crease, so we lose again. So at this point you begin to think, oh, maybe, maybe I can't do this. And then, you know, try that and not really making any progress. Uh, but, you know, why not try these ideas? And then, okay, let, here it is. Okay, and the, the inside was purple, so that's now on the outside, and now we're done. Okay, there's a beautiful 20 minute video made by Bill Thurston, so, um, or rather under the direction of his, so it's, it's worth a watch if you've never seen it. Um, okay, so then, you know, basically our challenge was formalize that. <laughs> you know, and if you've just started doing lean, you, you know, it's, a, it's not gonna be totally trivial. Um, okay. Um, but as I said, um, you know, actually, uh, if you really, so, you know, again, the history here is Smail understood, Smail understood the spaces of, of uh, the homotopy type of the space of, of immersions between two manifolds. And as our corollary got smooth, uh, the existence of an inversion, he didn't actually construct an inversion. He just knew that one must exist from his understanding of the homotopy type. Um, and that video was made when somebody actually constructed uh, an inversion. And, you know, as uh, you know, you may or may not know, there are now several inversions of the sphere have been constructed. And so if you really just wanted to formalize um, this theorem, there's a kind of a boring piece of work that you could do that, you know, I wouldn't personally be all that excited about, which is you could, there are even algebraic inversions of the sphere so, that clever people have come up with. Um, so you could actually write down the algebraic expressions that are an algebraic inversion of the sphere and you could then just you know, formally verify that it satisfies the conditions of being a diversion and you'd be done. So you know, we did not do that. Um, instead, we said, you know, we're gonna prove, we're gonna do, like, do the smale approach. We're gonna prove a, a theorem which just tells us about the homotopy type 
of immersions, and then there's a corollary, we'll get the existence. Um, okay, so what was that theorem? Well, it's a theorem due to Gromov from the 1970s. So I will um, tell you a little bit about that theorem. So it is uh, not just about you know, the two sphere and R3, of course, it's about uh, maps between you know, any two smooth manifolds, M and N. Uh, it's also about parametric families of maps. So if you care about maps from M to N, but you have some other parameter space P, in our case, this is actually the unit interval, uh, then this theorem will apply to families of maps. So in other words, smooth maps from P cross M to N. It's relative. So if you have some distinguished closed set inside your family, so inside P cross M, then uh, you can deform uh, your family of, uh, deform your family of maps while keeping it constant on this prescribed set C. So it's a relative theorem. For us, that relative set is gonna be like a little neighborhood of the endpoints of the interval. So R P cross M to N, that's gonna be like the unit interval I cross the two sphere into R3. And C is gonna be like a little neighborhood of uh, the endpoints of the interval crossed with this, this sphere. So we're gonna hold constant the immersion uh, that's the inclusion. We're gonna hold constant the immersion that's the antipode. That's our family of maps. And then we're gonna get a homotopy uh, between those. We're gonna deform relative to those. And then we're gonna learn about the existence of the immersion by just actually taking uh, the value of that homotopy at, at, at its end. Um, okay, so Gramos theorem is general for any manifold that's parametric for families. It's relative, you can, can prescribe behavior on a set. We need, uh, so far, you know, the parametric and relative we actually need. It allows control. I mean, we didn't necessarily care about this, but also you can, uh, you're gonna deform your map. Uh, uh, so you're gonna start with a candidate solution, which you're gonna deform into a true solution. Um, and it, it allows you to say, I only want to deform it, you know, by at most epsilon. You can dial it down as low as you like. Um, and then, uh, yeah, also, it's not just a theorem about immersions. So it's a, it's a powerful theorem. Uh, so, okay, so what if it, you know, I, it's kind of clear how it generalized to be parametric and relative and have this allowing control so you deform as little as possible and any manifolds. But when I say generalizes beyond the concept of immersion, uh, you know, again, maybe somebody knows, but, you know, you know what's that generalization? Well, uh, the idea there is you say, okay, so I'm going to go back from manifolds just to vector spaces just to simplify things for the purposes of giving the idea here. Um, so imagine you're considering a map of vector spaces F from E to F, and you have some relation that you care about, so a subset of E cross F, and you then say, okay, I'm looking for functions that solve that relation. You know, this is like trivial kind of logic level stuff. And it's like, okay, well, that's a function from E to F, by, and I'm saying that function solves that relation if, you know, X F of X is in that relation for all X. Okay, so then Gramoff says, fine, what about if you have a differential relation? So, and this is, a, you know, of course, there can be nth order differential relations. Um, so let's just go to first order. So a first order differential relation is a subset of E and F, and then also harm EF, that's the linear maps from E to F. In other words, it's the place where the derivatives of maps from E to F live. And then you say, okay, now a differentiable function from E to F is a solution of that relation if, well, it's, you know, X, F, X, F prime of X belongs to the relation for all X. And, you know, what's an example of, of a differential relation? Well, the immersion relation. Right, so this is just uh, triples where you know x is in E, y is in F, no restriction on those. Phi, that's a linear map between E and F, that has to be injective. So this is the sense in which Gramoff generalized uh, this theory to not just immersions, but to differential relations. And, and actually, as I say, it goes even beyond first order. Although we are, in this project, we content ourselves with first order because we kind of working hard enough already. Um, okay, so that's, that's the context. Uh, of generality of Gramoff's theorem. And then uh, one slide away from being able to state it, um, but it's useful to introduce some, some language and say a little bit more about it. Um, so the idea is that, you know, you know, you know wh wh how do you approach a problem like this, of, you know, looking for solutions to some relation or in this case, some differential relation? Well, um, the approach that turned out to work is you start off, and it's like a little hint from the topology that this is a good idea, but um, you start off with a candidate solution. And it's a very clever idea where you say, actually, you know, the relation 
um, having a solution to the relation means I have a function from E to F, and then I have its derivative, which is a function from E to where the derivatives live, so linear maps from E to F. And I can talk about, and, and you know, what I care about is the case when G is the derivative of F. But I can ask this easier question. I can say, well, look, let's just try and solve that relation with a pair of functions. G is the candidate derivative, F is the candidate function. And then I can talk about what it means for this data to solve the relation. It's just, of course, X, F, X, G of X lives in the relation. Um, and we call that a formal solution. And then there's a particular case of formal solutions, which are the ones that we really care about. And these are the holonomic or true solutions. And that's the case where G is actually the derivative of F. Um, and then Gramov says, a relation satisfies the H, H is for homotopy, the H principle, if any formal solution is homotopic to a true solution. And so in particular, in the case of the sphere aversion, that means if you can find a formal uh, solution, you can, uh, it's homotopic to a true solution, and in particular, there therefore exists a true solution. Um, and so, okay, so we have this concept of the H principle, this is something we've defined. Um, what is the theorem state? Well, it says that, you know, not every differential relation is going to satisfy the H principle. It's going to have this property that formal solutions are enough. But he identified this very, very nice class of relations which do. So if the relation is open, right, it's just a subset of some spaces. So if it's an open subset, and if it satisfies a convexity condition, which I'll say a little bit about, but unless somebody especially wants me to dig into the details of precisely that definition, I'll leave it. Um, so that as a top topological condition needs to be open, there's a convexity condition, so this geometric condition, and that's it. Any differential relation, as long as it's open and satisfies this really neat convexity condition, then the H principle holds. So immersions in positive co-dimension, so S2 to R3, that's positive co-dimension, so that works. Uh, they're, like, they easily are seen to be open and satisfy the convex convexity condition. And therefore, uh, if you want a true immersion, uh, or rather a true aversion, by Gramoth's theorem, you just need a formal solution. And a formal solution, is fairly easy. Um, so that's how you, that's like, you know, that's roughly how the, the argument goes at the informal level. Um, and I think this is my last informal slide. After this, I get back to some more formal stuff. Oh, no, I don't, anyway. Um, okay, so then this is like a slightly more uh, careful statement of the H principle that I just said in words. So 1973, roughly. Gromov said, if you have R, it's an open ample, that's that convexity condition that I'm sort of just slightly waving my hands about unless someone's especially interested. Open ample differential, first order differential relation for maps between two uh, smooth manifolds M and N. Then R satisfies the parametric relative C0 dense H principle. And you know, what does that mean? Well, any smooth manifold uh, P, so that's your parametric, parametric family, any closed subset, that's where you want to control behavior. You want to have the sense in which your solution is close, so you need a metric on the codomain n, and you need an error function epsilon. Um, and now you have your candidate family of solutions, F0. So these are formal solutions. So these will all be maps from you know, P cross M into N together with a candidate derivative. Uh, it's holonomic near C. So you're gonna say don't change the behavior near C. So like, if you're gonna get a true solution everywhere, that means in particular on C, and so you better have started with a true solution there because you're not allowed to change behavior there. So you have to be holonomic on C. Then there exists this, uh, a regular homotopy of smooth families of solutions. So you can, F0 just becomes FT. Uh, I put a hat on it to indicate that it is a new object. You know, it starts where you were. It finishes at holonomic solutions. It doesn't change on C, and it's, it's as close as you like to the base map of it. So the F is as close as you like. So that, this is Gramov's theorem that I keep kind of repeating in different ways. Um, this slide is mostly here because, of course, we have a formal statement of this in the Sphere Version Project, and I want to, to show you how this looks in Lean. Um, but I kind of first want to show you, you know, like even informally, there's quite a mouthful there, because you're about to see quite a mouthful in Lean, but it's not like it's not quite a mouthful in, in informal mathematics either. Um, okay, so this slide is, you know, copy-paste from our Lean 3 code of Sphere Version, and this is how, the, this is what this looks like. So we've uh, called this theorem Gramov, which is maybe not such a good name because Gramov has proved more than one theorem. Um, but anyway, in our project, um, so R is rel muffled. So this is like um, a different, this is our, you know, to be improved uh, name for a differential relation. 
uh, on smooth maps between a manifold M and M prime. And if it's ample, that's this convexity condition, and it's open. And then, you know, the rest of this is more or less the sorts of things that we saw. You know, you've got your closed set C inside P cross M. Uh, you have the epsilon. Uh, okay, that's got to be continuous. I forgot to say that informally. Uh, you have your formal, your family of formal solutions. You, you know, it has to be holonomic in a neighborhood of C. Um, and then the theorem says, well, there exists a family of formal solutions. And if you look just um, in the sort of middle line, it says R cross P to R. So that's where we, we started with a family of solutions from P to R, and now we've got R cross P. Um, and then it you know, satisfies various conditions. It agrees at zero, it's holonomic at one, doesn't change on C, and then the very last line, the distance is less than or equal to epsilon of the base maps. So, you know, this is, and, and this is proof completely. Sorry for Ian Lee. Um, and, you know, it's quite a lot of work, but, you know, it can be done. And e even this statement actually could, you know, we could, we have room to optimize this further, but it's not so hard to read. Um, okay, so, you know, that's part of my point already made, which is just, you know, you can do differential topology in lean. Uh, and this is what it looks like at the moment. I think it'll look even better in, you know, the coming six months and year and so on. Um, all right, so I've stolen this, the idea for this slide and the next one from a very nice talk that Patrick gave, which I'll link at the end. Um, but I thought um, it's, uh, I thought Patrick was right, when I, and that's why I stole it, that it's worth giving a sense of like how convexity arises. You know, so far it's just been this geometric condition that needs to be satisfied by your differential relation for the theorem to hold, but you know, you know how does it actually arise? And so this is like the simplest toy example um, where you can see that, you know, maybe convexity is the sort of geometric uh, property you, you're going to have to care about if, if you are interested in this theorem. So, okay, so this is the theorem. It says, let's just take a simple case. We just have a uh, one-dimensional domain. So map from R into F, and F is some uh, vector space, some real normed vector space, let's say. And I have a family of um, approximations to F, Fn. Uh, everything's smooth. I also have an open set in F. Um, and so you can think of F and Fn, these are like the derivative maps actually, so maybe I should have called these G. Um, and omega is like the set where the derivative does not vanish, or because this is one dimension, derivative vanishing is immersion, or in, you know, in higher dimensions it would be where uh, the derivative is injective, the immersion condition. Um, but for now we can, if you want, you can just you know, forget the context of how this uh, relates and just see it as a theorem about approximations of functions. Fn tends to F in the C0 topology. Uh, and the derivative of the approximations, they all belong to this good set, omega. And then the result is the derivative of the function that is the C0 limit, this must lie in the convex hull of omega. So, you know, pro probably most people have a mental picture of convex hull, but just to be clear, if the blackboard is, is F and, and these are some points, like this, then the convex hull, it's the smallest convex set that contains all of the points. Um, and uh, yeah, you, it's, you, you need the, the, the F needs to lie in the closure of that. Um, so, so what this, the way this theorem applies to our work is we're, we're looking for the FNs and we have F. And uh, because of this theorem, we know, I mean, of course we're in a far more general setting, but uh, here, because uh, because of this theorem, we know that there's only the only hope for finding the FNs is if the derivative of our F that we already have lies in the convex hull. So because of this theorem, you know that uh, there better be some property of your relation which says that the convex hulls that arise contain your derivatives. And then the proof is super easy. So you know the you know look it's it's two lines. So the left the first thing is like. 1 over n is my f of x plus h, you know, so this is f of, x, f of s plus 1 over n minus f of s all over 1 over n. Well, that's roughly the same thing, but replacing f with fn, because I've got fn tending to f in the C0 topology. Then, you know, school level fundamental theorem of calculus, that's actually equal to this line integral between 0 and 1. And then if you think in terms of Riemann sums, uh, that integral can be approximated by, like, you know, a sum of, uh, 
multiples, uh, a sum of like weights times that derivative evaluated at points in zero one, where the sum of the weights add up to, to one because it's these weights are just the widths of rectangles that I, into which I've chopped up the interval zero one. So that's a you know barycentric chord combination of points of Fn prime, but they all lie in omega. And so therefore all barycentric co combinations must lie in its convex hull. And then you have to pass through the closure, I guess, because you're taking a limit to get the integral. So, the, so this theorem basically, what this theorem says is if you're trying to, if you have, a, if you have a, in our case, a candidate derivative and you want to find families that deform to that, uh, then you'd better lie in the convex hull of the place where you need to be, which for us is the set of immersions. Um, and so convexity is just has to arise uh, as a concept. And then the amazing surprise is it turns out to be sufficient. Um, and then you can even give a sense of why it turns out to be sufficient. You know, like, how do you prove a theorem like this? How did, I don't know how Grammar thought of it, but, um, you know, what are the sorts of things you might do? Well, so the idea here is now, now I'm going to try and construct uh, maybe the FNs. Um, so I have omega. It's some blob there. It's not convex. Um, and I have some function f, and f has a derivative f prime. That's supposed to be a tangent there. It's not the best tangent, but anyway. Um, and we can see the, you know, the endpoint of that tangent vector, it doesn't lie in omega, so this is bad. I would like it to lie in omega. Um, but it does at least satisfy the necessary condition. It lies in its convex hull. And what I want to do is modify f, right? I, I'm, I'm going to change f a little bit so that its derivative does lie in omega. So like, you know, how do I do this? Um, well, one thing I could do is I could, I mean, I have a three stars there that I'll explain in a moment, but say you take the, the, the star on the right. I mean, I could just change F so that at the, at the point T where I've marked the derivative, it just for a little period of time, maybe epsilon along, it just goes in a straight line in the direction of star at the right speed. And then, then the derivative will lie in omega. The only problem with that is after this amount of time epsilon, I've gone off in a sort of a totally irrelevant direction. Uh, you know, I've arbitrarily chosen a point and I'm, I've just strayed away from F and I don't really have any control over this and it's kind of hard to know what to do then. So, okay, so that's one idea but it seems to have some problems. And then you can say, hmm, okay, well, what else could I do? Well, um, I, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna have to stray away from F a little bit because I, I am deforming it, but I want to do it in a way that sort of on average, you know, I haven't strayed away too much. So you could say, all right, well, since I'm in the convex hull, I can find a triangle of points. Uh, actually, I need to be in the interior of the convex hull, but you know, again, kind of skim over details unless people really want them. But since I'm in the interior of the convex hull, uh, I can find three points in a triangle. These are the three stars. And when I draw the triangle around them, then, then my derivative is indeed inside that triangle. And uh, now what I could do is I could say, well, you know, actually the way I've drawn this picture, it's roughly in the middle. So I could, I could head off in the direction of one of these triangle, one of the corners of this triangle for a third of my, for epsilon over three. And then I could like immediately just turn and I could head off in the direction of the next star for another epsilon over three. And then I could finish by turning for the final star epsilon over three. And because uh, this is roughly in the middle of that triangle, actually after those, after epsilon time, I'll have done roughly the same movement as if I just followed the derivative for time epsilon. And you know, functions are well approximated by the derivatives. That's what derivatives are. So that, that's actually quite a controlled way to deform the function because over time epsilon, I've just followed its derivative. That's, that's kind of good. The only problem is that's a totally unsmooth thing to do. Like this corners, every time I just said, I'm just gonna go in this direction, then I'm gonna immediately turn to this direction, then I'm gonna immediately turn to this direction. So you know, how do you deal with this? Well, there's this lovely idea, uh, which is, okay, I'm not quite gonna do that. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose a smooth path gamma that join inside omega uh, that joins these three points. And actually I'm going to head in the direction, uh, uh, head in a direction where I get parameterized along gamma uh, smoothly. But I'm gonna spend almost all of my epsilon over three time just sitting stationary uh, or all, not quite stationary, but you know, hardly moving at one of the stars. And then when I've almost used up my budget of epsilon over three time, then I'm gonna shoot on smoothly, but, but you know, really, really fast along the curve. And, and then I'm gonna grind to a halt 
at the second star, and I'm going to sit there for roughly epsilon over three again. And then I, remaining smooth, I'm going to shoot off to the final star. And now I've like smoothly, you know, by choosing gamma, I've got a way to smoothly deform f in such a way that over time epsilon, I roughly follow the derivative, but always at a point where my derivative is lying where I want it to lie in omega. And I can do this, I can find such a gamma because the derivative lied in the convex hull. I could find this triangle around it. Um, and then the final detail is, actually, you're going to want to do this again after time, epsilon, after time epsilon, you know, for the next epsilon step. So you, to be consistent, you'd better end up where you started with. So gamma better not just be a path, it should actually be a loop. And you just undo what you did. Um, so, okay, so this is the idea. It's a very nice idea um, that you should look for families of smooth loops inside omega, which is, morally speaking, the space of linear, uh, injective linear maps. So the place where you're, the derivative of your function that you want to be, where you, the place where you would like it to live, because you're looking for, in our case, immersions, or for a general differential relation, it's, it's just part of the data of the differential relation. So you're looking for these gamma. Now, okay, fine. So, you know, that's roughly the idea of what we're trying to do. Doesn't sound that easy to formalize. And also, I haven't really given, you know, I've argued that ga you know, finding gamma gives you a prescription that sounds like it might be the right way to define f. But I mean, I haven't actually told you how to use a gamma. I've only slightly said that it should be possible or something, or, you know, might be a good idea. But, uh, and of course, you know, Gromov and, and his various successors gave precise prescriptions for how to use such a, such a family of loops gamma to do this. But five years ago, Melanie Tellier uh, got a really beautiful uh, implementation of this idea. She gave this uh, really, really neat, tidy, local way to say, look, if you've got these gammas, I'll tell you how to deform f. So she proved this theorem. And it's, it's, it's really easy to prove. It's really hard to think of this, this statement. Uh, but once you have it, so it, it's really easy to prove. Um, so Patrick, I think, noticed this, and he recognized that this was like, simultaneously, you know, quite a big innovation in the theory of convex integration that was, you know, coming up to 50 years old at the time. Um, and also, you know, a really promising avenue for formalization. Um, so I guess, I mean, I'm slightly guessing at Patrick's motivation here, but I think, I think Tellier's breakthrough uh, of this very, very nice implementation of convex integration was, was part of the motivation for proposing this project. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna say too much about this theorem. Uh, partly for time reasons, and you're probably slightly sick of uh, me waffling on. Um, but, uh, yeah, the thing to take away from here is, you know, F is sort of like what you've got, Fn is what you're trying to create, uh, gamma is this input, um, and then the, you know, what it tells you is that, like, the first bullet point, Fn is very, very close to F. That's good, that's our C0 close. The, the ith partial derivative of Fn doesn't change or barely changes. Uh, actually, this is an inductive argument, right? So the way you make the derivative injective is you first prove d by dx is non-zero, and then you prove that d by dy is not uh, collinear with d by df, uh, d by dx, and then you prove d by dz doesn't line the plane spanned with d by dx and d by dy. And so you, there's actually an inductive argument, and this theorem is what you apply at the jth step. So you want to not mess with the ith derivatives too much, but you do want to control the jth derivative. You know, the jth derivative, that's the vector you're now trying to put in omega. And so the last bullet point there, that's saying, well, these new deformed functions fn, their jth derivative is very, very close to gamma. That's our family of loops. But gamma, of course, takes value in omega. So that's the fn's, their jth derivative is exactly where I want them to be. Um, and I hardly change the other der derivatives. And so if I induct, I can get a deformed function that has all of the partial derivatives lying where they need to be. Omega, of course, is changing at each step. Okay, so, you know, this is all a little bit hand wavy, but I'm hoping gives a sense of the mathematics that, you know, this is all, all it required was time, and it was, it was also a really nice way to thoroughly understand a beautiful bit of differential topology that I previously knew very little about. Sorry, what's this um, gamma x bar in the second line? Oh, yeah, yeah, so, so actually, I, I think I did define this at the bottom of this slide. So, um, I started out by saying, you know, the derivative, the endpoint of that derivative is roughly in the middle of the triangle. But you know, all we really know is that like it's inside the triangle. So it has some barycentric coordinates and gamma is some loop through these points. And what I want is I want gamma tree parameterized so that it spends 
an amount of time proportional to the barycentric coordinate of that point at each point. So if that's true, then when I integrate it, the average will actually be the sum of the barycentric coordinates. And so that, that average is gamma bar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and indeed, um, you know, I need, I need, yeah, so, okay. So that's, okay, so that's informal statement of Tellier is a very nice thing. Um, this is essentially the formal statement. You know, again, it's lean three. Uh, it looks, I mean, when I said, you know, this is sort of a phenomenon that happens when you're formalizing. On the previous slide, I just had lemma, all this stuff. Here I have like definition, definition, lemma, lemma. And actually, I could even have included one or two more definitions or lemmas here. So, you know, theorems become, you know, because actually there's, there's data, you know, if you're in lean, like a lemma is just a, a, a statement and a def is data. You know, Melanie has, or Tellier has given data here. She's actually said, this is FN. So that becomes uh, uh, a def and, you know, and so on. So again, I'm not gonna try and dig into the lean too much, but I promise you that lean agrees that these things still work. Um, and I, I'm, again, I'm trying to do this thing where slide by slide, I give like the informal and the formal. And I think if you just see the formal, you maybe think, well, oh, that's quite a mouthful, but you know, so is the informal. We're just a little bit more used to looking at it. And, to me, this actually looks great. Um, okay, so that, so that was that. Um, right, okay, so, um, yeah, so I wanted to comment on the effort. So, uh, it's, so it's a three-stage argument, really. So I've just argued that, like, uh, I've just given Melanie, or Tellier's formula for if you, have, uh, if you have loops, you use this kind of crazy integral formula that she supplies, and then you get the deformed functions, but you know you have to have the loops. So stage one of the proof is working out exactly what properties these loops need to satisfy, like this gamma bar equals d by dj that you were highlighting on the previous slide. So, but highlight, you know, working out what properties you need these family of loops to have, and then proving in lean that such a family exists. Um, that was quite hard uh, because there's a lot of freedom. Like these loops, and like they're not like the unique fixed point of some operator. You know, they're like there's, a lot, there's loads of freedom for these loops to exist. And so, you know, you have to make choices along the way and, you know, maybe some choice that you make here, you subsequently realize, actually, if I chosen that a little bit differently, then this bit of the proof is a bit easier. And actually that's a phenomenon, phenomenon informally as well. Um, so that was, we thought that would be quite challenging. Um, and Patrick broke it down into a bunch of lemmas and then some of those lemmas got broken down even further in the course of actually carrying out the work. But you know, I think it was in line with expectations. In fact, I, I don't know. I should probably be asking Floris for his views. Where, where's Floris? Yeah. Would you say that that's fair? The supply of loops was like hard, but we thought it would be about as hard as it was. I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, and then the convex integration, uh, Patrick mostly did that, right? Yeah. So, but I, the feeling I got was likewise, that was maybe the easiest bit, even though it was kind of the most sophisticated in some sense, yeah. But then the globalization, which was, um, you know, you, I've slightly waved my hands back and forth between the, the case where I'm in a vector space, which of course in my head is like the coordinate patch of a manifold and in the manifold. Um, and that's very easy to do informally. Uh, transferring this from the local results and, and putting them up onto the manifold where like, there's not really any ideas. There's just like a proficiency in understanding how to work with manifolds and coordinate patches and partitions of unity and so on informally. Formally that was like w way beyond expectations, right? I mean, yeah, right, yeah, okay, so, right, I mean, nice, yeah, okay, so that's comments on effort, um, lessons learned, so Sebastian Gozel had, had to, built up this really very, very nice theory of manifolds that actually Flowers talked about yesterday, um, and uh, I mean, Sebastian's a brilliant mathematician, so I would have expected it to work, but you know, you never know until you use something if it, if it really does work. So there can be subtle, uh, subtle awkwardnesses that you, know, you only discover when you use a theory. So that was a big learning is like, no, the manifold library works very, very well. I mean, maybe as we were saying a moment ago, we had to add to its API uh, as we went, but the theory is very solid and it works very well. And that's really encouraging. Um, we can formalize non-trivial results in differential topology. I, I, you know, my null hypothesis was yes, we definitely can, but 
still, it was an open question. Um, I think maybe point three, I'm overstating things a little bit, but I was a little bit surprised at the amount of effort that's required to, to get smooth fiber bundles working. Um, but anyway, they're, they're definitely trickier than I was expecting. Uh, point four, I think, is really worth emphasizing a lot. So, you know, in MATLAB, we have everything in one place. We have only one definition of everything, and everything's mutually consistent. Um, so that's, you know, a monolithic library. This has not always been the practice uh, in proof assistance or just in software development in general. Uh, I don't think you could do this project without that because, you know, we're just drawing on so many branches of the library at once. You need them all to be mutually compatible. And there's no way we could, we could handle our work and then also, you know, gluing together incompatible bits of the library as well. So, yeah, I'm, I think that's worth it. And then, yeah, I mean, hopefully we will migrate all of the project to MATLAB. Uh, a lot of the work, you know, like some of the work we just said, oh, we need a theory of convexity, and we just developed that within MATLAB. So that was like work for a Sphere version project that never actually arrived in, in the Sphere version repository for, because we just worked directly in MATLAB. So that stuff, there's no migration effort at all, and there was quite a bit of that. Um, and then there were also results that we added to our projects and then we've subsequently migrated, but there's also a moderate legacy of stuff that we should still migrate. Um, but even with what's been migrated so far, I think there was like, you know, the filter library got lots of small lemmas added and, the, and definitions and point set topology likewise and calculus and convolutions, barycentric coordinates, convexity, bundle theory, all of these parts of MATLAB already, even without any further migration efforts have benefited. So, you know, that's another reason I just like doing these projects. Um, people who don't care about your project, you know, unknowingly get benefits because the library as a whole gets better. Um, and then we saw one of these, or was it yesterday? Um, but this is up here, I mean, it's a sort of a nice picture, but it's up here mostly um, to remind me to emphasize how well, how, how good uh, a proof assistant can be as a collaboration aid. Um, so each of these green nodes and these boxes, I mean, this is a manually maintained graph. Um, it'd be nice to have an automatic one. Um, but each of these is like a definition or a non-trivial lemma that we had to prove. And they're all for stated formally very, very carefully. And, you know, there were lots of, green means you're finished. This graph was entirely blue or white at some point. And um, it's very, very convenient to have, you know, this to know what your co-authors have already done. I mean, of course, we talk to each other as well, but, you, you know, you can, and if they say, oh, I'm working on this bit of the construction of loops, there's a formal statement of it. You can already start using it and just wait till they later fill it in. So, yeah, it was a really great aid to collaboration. Uh, sorry, and also, Patrick built the, Patrick Masso, who proposed the project, built the software uh, that, that generates this and hooks it up automatically to a, to an informal proof and to the formal proof. It's all, it's quite a nice system um, and it's been used elsewhere, but it was first built for this project. Yeah, and then there's some additional resources. So like we wrote a paper about this. Uh, there's a website, which I think has got a lot of good material on it, mostly built by Patrick. Um, there's some previous talks, which I watched before I made my talk and you'll see I've borrowed some ideas from them. Um, yeah, and so these are, these are links. Maybe if I put my slides somewhere, they'll be clickable. So. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, good. So you said about sphere is there, now you only need to find the common solution. Right, yeah. And you said that it's easy, so how is it easy? Uh, it's still a bit fiddly. Uh, you know, like you need to, uh, you know, you, you need to pick a base map and you need to pick a candidate derivative and you, have to have some theory of rotations of the sphere because you're, you're transporting the uh, tangent space around. Um, but, you know, like it's a few days work or something with, with the, I mean, it's all a function of what's in the library already, but it was, it was fiddly, but not, not so hard. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. So the question was, thank you, uh, was uh, I, everything I've just said shows that the existence of a sphere inversion uh, can be shown as long as you have a, a formal solution. Um, but you know, how hard is it? I've claimed it's easy to get a formal solution, and is it indeed? And, yeah, I claim, I claim it is. Yeah. Uh, so the formal solution is essentially already an approximate. Yeah, 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 it's, yeah. 
yeah, it's just at some points the the uh, the the formal derivative won't be the derivative of the base map. You know, in fact, probably it mostly won't be. But if you wanted, you could you could make it be equal to that, and you could you could make the formal solution be holonomic. You know, as much as you like. Yeah. Well, in theory, you can make it be holonomic everywhere because we know there's a true solution. But it probably wouldn't be too hard to make. Anyway. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Is that Um, personally, I'm, I, not really, um, I, you know, I, I already am in a situation where I'm, I'm probably never going to have a theorem that's like by sphere version. It feels even less likely that I'm going to be able to say by this particular sphere version. But I mean, there's some interest, like, you know, actually what Smail proved is that if you look at the space of immersions from S2 to R3, uh, you know, I claim this is an object we should understand if we care about manifolds. And Smail proved that this is homotopy equivalent to the two-fold loop space of SO3 cross SO3. And so he got, and then he realized, but wait a minute, pi zero of this is equal to pi, well, you know, pi zero of this, well, that just adds on, so that's going to be pi two of what's inside SO3, and this is connected, so that goes away, and that's zero. And he's like, oh, this is connected, so this is connected, and so that, that's the, the, you know, the result. Um, so that's fine, but, you know, then you can say, well, what about pi one of this? So pi one of this is, well, it's, uh, it's going to be pi three of SO3, so that's going to be Z, uh, and then pi one of this, that's Z2. Um, and so I guess you could, you could ask if you can deform some of, you know, this is a few different immersions you could ask you know, about deforming them. So this maybe some questions related to the explicit immersions that might be slightly interesting, but now mostly I'm, I'm not interested in explicit immersions. You could from... Yeah, you could, yeah, yeah. I mean, the video doesn't really, I love the video, right? That's why I chose to spend some time on it, but it doesn't actually prove anything. I mean, yeah. who's to say there wasn't a crease inside, you know, that none of us could see? We just have to trust that Thurston, you know, Uh, I'll take, just go, yeah, go ahead. This is not my field at all. Actually, it's a great question. I should have a prepared answer. I don't know. I, what other differential relations come up and what are, I, 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 I don't know, yeah. Um, sorry, I should have a good answer there and I don't. It's a very, Patrick or maybe Flores, do you have anything yeah, in mind? Yeah. I think the Butler conjecture is probably a problem in Oh, really? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the h cobordism or something. Yeah. yeah, but I don't know how, I don't, I don't quite know the, I, don't, I, don't think I mean, it's not quite, yeah, I mean, not quite sure how close those things are, but I do know that the same person did it, so there probably is a link. But yeah. I'm sorry, you had a question again. Oh, um, I, I don't know, but I mean, I, I doubt it just because you've no partitions of unity and things are much more, much more rigid. And this is about things being flexible. So, yeah. So I presume not. Yeah. I mean, I, I, as you say, the spaces themselves would have to change, but yeah. Just realized I forgot to repeat all the last few questions. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh. Say again. I have done none of it to my, uh, yeah. So I, I probably will help, but I've been too lazy. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks very much.